Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 344 for Monday, May 2nd, 2022. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include Bandzoogle, where coupon promo code Gig Gab, uh, three Gs, two of them are together, G I G G A B, gets you 15% off your first year of any subscription. We'll talk about why you're going to want to go there and do that uh, shortly. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, as usual, I'm Dave Hamilton. Wait, I don't know if that's. If it's Durham, New Hampshire, as usual, but sometimes changes, or if I'm Dave Hamilton, as usual, and sometimes that changes, I don't know. You can help us figure it out. You're confusing me, Dave. I know. I confused here, myself. Here, as usual, it's Paul Kent, as usual, <laughs> most of the time, in the Pomo, California. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Questioning our, our very identities right out of the gate. That's going to turn some brand new listeners off thanks for listening folks we appreciate you giving us a shot and we're sorry no that's not what we meant (laughs) how are you my friend i'm good man it's been a busy weekend about to be a very busy month about to be a very busy summer so it's all good good. fun things going on yeah so i played i played three gigs this week this past weekend how about you i played no gigs this weekend i uh i got my covid shot my second boost or whatever the heck it is on Friday evening. And, uh, and that kind of knocked me out for Saturday, which was wonderful in a sense. It was nice to be forced to just be on the couch for a day. Cause that's rare for me. Mm. You know, it's, it's good to take a, a mental health day, if you will. <laughs> so it worked out. All right. I, I had a, yeah, I had a pretty low key weekend. Um, did some housework and, you know, yard work and things like that. Cause it's, we have to turn the house over because now it's spring kind of thing. Uh, yeah. So we did some of that yesterday, but yeah, no, no, no gigs. I, I did a, quite a bunch of, quite a bit of recording over the past couple of days and some mixing and mastering for the next fling track that we're working on. So I'm excited about that. So you, you guys are kind of one track at a time and just kind of spoon feeding this stuff out. Yeah. There. We're trying to release one a month and we're almost hitting that mark. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. But it's been fun. Yeah, we've got some gigs coming up and all that, but but yeah, the one track at a time thing seems to work really well for for the way we want to do things, the time we all have to commit, and and it still gives us time to get together and and like jam and play. Whereas you know, if all we were doing was recording, then we would have to. I mean, that would still be playing, but it's a different focus, you know. So it, it kind of allows us to do to have our cake and eat it too. Yeah, no, I get it. Yeah, I have kind of an interesting place for us to start today. All right. So the, the question is, uh, the rehearsal list band. So, you know, my life has changed. I've moved away. We had one rehearsal scheduled a month from January through May. The one in May can't happen. So we really only had our, and actually our January one didn't happen because of COVID. So we had two in February, one in March, one in April. That's it. And a, a couple of moving parts here. One is one of the we had three things that we were trying to accomplish by rehearsing again. Sure. Remember, the band's been together a long time. We have a lot of stuff we've been playing for a long time. So one is we have a new guy in, a, in an important role. We've got a new drummer. Right. Two, we wanted to put some fresh paint on the, on the show and, and add some material. And three is we wanted to just kind of, you know, we haven't played very much, you know, so we wanted to kind of get a little bit of a rhythm. We've had a couple gigs, maybe one a month, maybe two a month. Not a lot. And a long, like a month between seeing each other in the last one, you know, I was gone on a vacation for a while, but, you know, we went really from the end of March to the end of April without even seeing each other. Uh, And now we're done. And we have three gigs in May. I think we have five or six gigs in June. And then we have, you know, six to 10 gigs, July, August, September. But we're done rehearsing. And the, the gig we had this past weekend was good. We delivered the goods. You know, the client was happy. And it was one of those things where the difference between what the client hears and what you know is going on on stage, you know, <laughs> how much do you want to wave that flag, you know, and say, come on, guys. But, you know, I, I 
our band is done rehearsing for the year, you know, pretty much unless we're going to get together in the fall because schedules are what they are. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. So you live, have you, you ever live. been in that kind of situation where literally, you know, the expectation is do your homework. Don't be that guy. Come ready to play. And I would say most you, bands that I've most gigging bands that I've been in, uh, some of them start that way and most of them get that way. Yeah. I, you know, I remember when I joined, when I got here to New Hampshire, so 17 years ago, I posted on Craigslist saying that, you know, drummer looking to play. And I started getting emails and, you know, responses, which was great. And I, I, the band I wound up joining out of the gate was that band knockoff, a uh, four piece classic rock, female fronted band. And the way Bill, our guitar player, got my attention or decided to get my attention, I would have seen his email either way. But like the subject of the message was dollar signs, gigs booked, no, you know, no rehearsals kind of thing. Like it, that was the pitch was mm. we're going to get we, you know, we know that there's someone out there that A, is interested in this scenario, but B, can actually deliver in this scenario. And and the, the Venn diagram there might not be a full overlap. Like there might be a lot of people interested in that, but you know, you got to be able to, you got to be able to, like you said, do your homework and show up prepared mm -hmm. and listen and big ears and, you know, all those things that are super important to being a functional member of a band. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I remember it, you know, and then the, the body of the email supported that. He's like, look, here's the dates we have booked next. Here's what these gigs pay. We would want to get together and rehearse twice uh, and, and then we're off to the races and it was like, okay, I mean, that's fair. Like that's, you know, going in. and he's like, and we're playing Friday night at this place. You should come down and sit in for two songs to audition. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, I, this is what I was looking for, you know? And, um, so, but then like, you know, Uptown Celebration was the same way we rehearsed two, maybe three times. And then it was just gig, 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 gig. Um, so yeah, I, I would say most gigging bands and Bitter Pill is that way when we're gigging heavily, you know, because it's because yeah. that's what people have time for. You know, it's it's not the only thing in our lives. So yes, I okay. definitely have been in that scenario. <laughs> so let's hold this up to the light a little bit. Yeah. So having you having done it both ways, me having done it both ways, um, a well rehearsed band is a thing. I mean, yes, good, oh, yeah. good players can show up and play. But I would I would say it's not the same as a band that, you know, that that has spent a lot of time together learning the nuances, hearing the nuances of of what your bandmates are doing, right? Well, that that's what so, it is, right? Is you you can be a a capable musician for that scenario. You can be prepared as an individual. Everybody else on stage can be equally as prepared as individuals. You can all know the songs. You can all come together. And you can play them, but yes, you you hit the nail on the head. Those nuances of tweaking the songs together, working out that special little harmony thing, the, the little moments in songs that either need work or can be enhanced just don't happen when you're showing up and playing. Yeah. And then if we back away, you know, here's the flip side of it is a lot of those things are meaningful to 10% of the audience you're going to play for. And perhaps a hundred percent of the musicians on stage. That, no, that's absolutely true. But, right. I, but I would say, you know, this is the, the very interesting question. It is the, it is the time in for reward and, you know, what, what the value of that is. So yes, to a hundred percent of the musicians, but if you gave them the choice of how would you like to just really <laughs> show up and play a gig and get paid, or how would you like to rehearse every week? And, you know, there's no pay for that, but, but, you know, we're going to be really tight and, you know, 10% of the people who listen to us is going to get a kick out of the little things that we do. It's a hard like, sell, like, man. I, yes. That's, I, that's what I'm finding. Yeah. yeah even, it is a hard even sell. when you know that it's going to, mean something to you and presumably all the other musicians on stage, but certainly, you know, I, it being in those scenarios where those little things make a difference. And and certainly with bitter pill, you know, we just recorded uh, our, our new album, which is coming out soon. And in the studio, obviously we spent time to nitpick some of those things and really hone them together, even on songs that we had been playing all summer. Mm -hmm. And now when we play gigs, we, get to reap the rewards of, of those little nuances and benefits. And 
Some of those songs are just so much better. But, you know, am I pushing to have the band rehearse every week? No. If the band, you know, if we if somebody said, well, we should get together and rehearse, which I, I will state out loud, I really want to do before we go play these songs, that the new ones that we haven't been playing live before we yeah. go play our record release party. Like, it's super important that we're able to do that. Um, yeah, it, like it, 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 it doesn't happen. So yeah, no, it's a, it's a weird double-edged sword. Yeah. I would also say that there's another aspect to this and that is there are bands that are made up of pros who are in that rarefied air that can walk in and just play a show and, 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 and you can actually dissect that a little bit, but often, you know, a lot of bands are made up of people who have varying levels of talents sure. and sometimes practices sure. to help the, help the less proficient get up to speed or, you know, improve their skills That's or you know, get to a certain point, you know, right. I mean, yeah, but, I, I hate to think about it that way because I certainly, I mean, I've been playing for a very long time. Uh, I, I trust my skills. I trust my instincts and I could convince myself that I can be great without having to rehearse but I, I know that any rehearsal is going to help me too. But you're right. Yeah. Sometimes there's the least the lesser experienced musicians that will benefit more from those rehearsals, maybe. That's certainly a conversation to be had. But I, I try not to get caught in that trap, if you will. Yeah. And then another thing is the self-perception of where someone is on the continuum, right? Like yeah. I, I have I have been amazed over my time playing music. You know, picking music up again about 25, 26 years ago. Right. And, right. and uh, you know, th th those who consider themselves A-list players who I just don't see it, you know. Yeah. And I've seen, I've seen you know, I've seen horn players who um, aren't as good as other horn players but talk themselves into really good gigs. And, you know, then they have a resume and a reputation based upon the gigs, not based upon their chops. And it's just a very interesting thing. I've seen guys who say, oh, yeah, you know, I can just walk into your gig and play it, and they cannot do that. I mean, literally, whatever they think they're lit. And I, I often wonder at the end of one of those things where clearly they've banged their way through a gig, whether they thought that was good enough. Like if that, you know, there's like you get what you get, and I can get through the gig. Yeah. And then there's guys, you know, we, and then we've had other guys who have killed themselves. Like when you came out and played that weekend for us, you killed yourself in prep. Like you, you went hard. Like, well, I didn't think we were going to have a rehearsal. I, I mean, well, but like, respect and props and, you know, like, like your standard of what you wanted to do for your reputation, like those guys who banged them themselves through my gig, they, they probably aren't going to get a, another call back. Sure. Yeah. Because there fair. are guys who will go a little bit farther. Yes, that's, that's true. And, and I'll be, I'll be perfectly honest. There's many gigs where I have put in that level of prep, I would say that, that that's the most I've ever put into like a what I'll call a one off. I mean, I realize we played a couple of gigs together, but you know, you know, it was a it was a one off weekend, if you will. And I mm -hmm. there was no expectation of getting hired for the gig, right? <laughs> like you know, it wasn't No, but it, you're my friend and you cared about me and correct. you know and you care about yourself, right? Like yes. you knew you were gonna play with some guys and you you would want them to think I, well, well of you and I wanted to have fun with it. And and yeah. I've learned that that's the difference is I can play at I can I can do a minimal level of prep and usually make the musicians on stage happy that I was there to cover for them. Right. Like, you, you know, yeah. when you're going into sub, the bar is lower, whether whether people think it's, it is or not. Like it's you know, we needed somebody. You stepped up. Thank goodness you're here. Like being a warm body in the room. You've already earned some cred. Right. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And and. But what I find is the more prep, like beyond the minimal amount that I need to please the other musicians on stage, there's, you know, the prep that I can do beyond that, that makes it enjoyable for me because I can sweat through the gig and wondering like, crap, I forget, like, does this song have two choruses or three? What's the mm -hmm. outro? And now I'm looking around the stage, you know, trying not to look like a deer in the headlights, but desperately feeling like a deer in the headlights. You know, uh oh, am I going to screw up the ending to this? What's this? Versus, I'm going to prep each song as far as I can go and and enjoy playing it. Y you know, and that's there's there's a difference there. I don't always have the time to get it to the I'm going to go have fun at this gig. You know, phase. But but yeah, for that gig, I absolutely did. And then and then there was one tune 
where like the day of the gig, we were having breakfast and you started talking through the ending of it. And I'm like, uh, dude, that wasn't on any of the notes that I have. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so we, we played it through and it worked out fine. It was great, but it was one of those moments, but it was one of those moments, not two sets worth of those moments. Right. Right. And that makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've talked about this before. There are bands who recognize the professional bands that are, 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 you know, instruments of finance, you know, they are put together yeah. for the point of, of creating money, you know, gigs that pay well, yeah. they organize their band with books that they can give a sub because they know a sub is a likely thing. Cause that's the nature of it's all just the, how it is. All that's the players right. that there are. Yep. And usually I guess those things are, the band is usually owned and led by a guy who's like, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, drive the bus on this and it's going to be me. So the degree to which people are loving or not loving the band is largely based on how good a show I give them with a good solid band behind me. And you make the band interchangeable parts. That's just not a bad business strategy to, for something like that. Sure. But it's not the business strategy that most people have. Most people are like, you know, I want to play in a band and, you know, let's go find, I want to play with some friends or let's go find some good like minds who like the same type of music or, you know, whatever it may be. And it's painful when a guy doesn't show up or yeah. can't show up. I don't say doesn't show up. Yeah, yeah, um, fair. And, it, you know, th that's hard. But it is. It, it has been a source of amazement to me as to, you know, how musicians self-perceive that concept. I think that's probably the longest thread that we have is what is a professional, right? I think that's the thing we've been talking about seven <laughs> years. Since day one. Show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, you know, if you get paid, you're a professional. No, everybody kind of gets paid. Well, well and, uh, according so, to the IRS, you're a professional. <laughs> if you get paid. Yeah. Yeah. But beyond that, but if you you're, put, if you put right. 20 musicians in a room and you had to come up with a consensus, you know, yeah. that's, that's really the interesting thing. Here's another, here's another point. Um, musicians, especially as they get better, are pretty protective of their time and they don't want to be on a gig, you know, any, you know, any longer that they want. If you're going to play a wedding and, and you need a sub, for example, he's probably, and it's a good player. He's probably not going to give you an eight, 10 hour day, He'll come, you know, for sound check maybe, or he'll come for downbeat or, you know, whatever it may yeah. be. And there's a lot of subs like that. But I'm actually finding that the whole issue of sound check, you know, is a, is a thing. I mean, a band should take a sound check. Every venue is different. I mean, I get the whole thing about rolling in and you know, I guess we'll talk a little bit about more, more details about the roll in and set up and go type of thing. But you know, we showed up for a private gig the other day and our, our advanced guys and Bill and, uh, the place where they were going to have the band play. We didn't do, we didn't do a walkthrough of the venue okay. in advance. And, and I guess, you know, the, the question is whether, whether that's that absolute necessary. And, and I think it probably is anyway, <laughs> well, where they were well, about it's to only the band, necessary for the gigs where you don't do it and regret it. Yeah. Yeah. But well, you, yeah. <laughs> but you don't know which ones those are, do you? Yeah. Yeah. So we showed up for this and the band was literally playing into a wicker wall with the dancers on the other side of the wicker wall. Wait, wait, and, slow down. You know, wait, wh what is the, you got to explain this to me because I like, I have a vision now and I'm thinking, you know, you, you did rawhide all night long and there was chain uh -huh. link or something, but that's not what happened. Right. Well, it's, it would have sort of looked like that. So essentially <laughs> the layout of this venue, there was like a, a gazebo type structure. Okay. Um, and the dancers would have been in the gazebo type structure and the band would have been immediately outside the gazebo playing in, in to this gazebo, but the gazebo was, you know, enclosed. There was like a cutout where, the, where people would go, but largely it was a wicker wall. And, um, we got there and we found, and this is, you know, no one's going to have any interaction with the band. It's you know not going to be good for anyone. Luckily we could move some things around, but, that then started a process of we had to wait for the client to get there to approve moving things around, which cut into setup time, which then, you know, gave us a sprint for sound check time before, before the guests started arriving for the, you know, the private event. And so, you know, it's just kind of a downward spiral of, you know, what is professional? What a professional is, is make sure that these events go great. Not that you survive them, you know, and I would guess right. if you're charging enough, you do a site walk through, you know, that's part of being a professional. You give your advanced team whatever number of hours is needed to comfortably be done and have instruments checked. Here's a good example. We had one guy who was pushing it on time. And of course, he's pushing it on time on top of everything else getting pushed back. 
And now, you know, we're all sitting there in our jeans and, and ripped T-shirts thinking we would have been done with, with uh, sound check by then. Ooh. And because everything gets pushed back. And then the last guy who got to sound check, he had a piece of gear that wasn't working. It happens. That's why you sound check. Well, it happened. Well, it happens especially when, when when everything's getting behind schedule. It seems to happen a lot more often. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, you know, what is a professional? A professional is 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 a group that insists on taking care of the details correctly, without stress. I, yeah. And I would actually think without stress, yes, your time is valuable. But doing the doing things right, I think, would be one of the dividing lines that I would put in there. So, what's a professional? Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. There's degrees of this for sure. That's fascinating, man. It's such a weird, I don't know. Yeah. It's, um, I think we've all been on stage with people who were like, wow, look at that guy. I want to be more like that. Or I should be more like that. Although I hate the word should, but you know, we sometimes say it to ourselves, right? Like, man, that guy's showing me up like, okay, I gotta, I gotta <laughs> change my game. Right. And that's okay. Like, that's a good thing to, to be aware of that and see that and, and strive for, for more. Right. Like, I mean, I think at some level, that's what drives all of us as musicians. You know, we see people who play the same instrument that we do. And sometimes they play literally our instruments and it's like, man, I need to learn how to make my instrument sound like that. Right. You know, that's good. But then we've also been uh, on gigs with those people where they're slacking and it's super frustrating and, you know, they don't have their stuff together and they don't understand how to be that, uh, you know, uh, self-reliant person that shows up and contributes their part so everybody else can do, you know, their jobs beyond that, right? Like that's that's how – when I show up at a gig – I want to be the person that brings the least amount of friction with me. And, and, you know, I'm a drummer, so I have a lot of gear. Obviously my load in time is going to be longer. Like there's going to be, there's some friction baked into what I do. And then I'm also me. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a conflict of interest. I, I cause friction everywhere, but I, I try when it comes to like sound checks and, and those sorts of things to have all my stuff together and be ready so that, when somebody says, Hey, can you do this? It's like, yep. And I'm ready for you to send me signals. You know, I'm ready to send you signals when you're ready. That whole thing makes the process go faster. When somebody's asking, you know, the band, what do you want in your monitors? N knowing how to put your finger in the air, you know, up or down, like learning all of those things that can make the efficiency of a gig so much better. I watched a lot of that at South by this year. Cause you know, you'd see bands changing over all the time. And it's a it's like it's a masterclass in simultaneously what to do and what not to do, watching how every different engineer sort of interacted with the band and got them set up fast. And I think that's a valuable skill or a valuable lesson to go and just watch. I don't know. I'm rambling, but it's it's important stuff, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's crazy. We got a an ongoing the it's, ongoing search for perfection. It, it, well, it's, yeah, it's the quest, right? I, um, we got a great email from our friend Dan East. It was kind of in reply to our, well, it was in reply to our discussion about ampless and monitorless stages, but it goes so, it really became like gear gab. And I know that we all love gear gab. So I would love to go through that if uh, if we're done with with uh, the rehearsalist band for now, anyway. Yep, if that works. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. Uh, really, though, the next thing that I would love to do, if it's okay with you, Mr. Kent, before we go into dance thing, is I want to talk about our sponsor for the day. Great. All right. Yeah, our sponsor today is Bandzoogle. This is a company that is built. Exactly for us, for you and for me. Paul obviously uses Banzoogle with not one, but two of his projects because Banzoogle is an all in one platform that makes it super easy to build a beautiful website and electronic press kit for your music. And they have all the features that we need for professional websites. All of them are built in, including things like. You want to use a custom domain name, which we highly recommend. They'll do that. They'll host it and manage that for you. They have dozens of fully customizable design templates 
So you get to build the website you want without knowing how to build a website. They know how to build a website. They've built these templates. They're ready for mobile and desktop. They've done all of that hard work so that you can do the easy work of dropping in your pictures and changing the, the way you want it to look. And then it just works. And then they've got all the tools to sell your music and merch. All of that's commission free. In addition, all the crowdfunding and fan subscription features are commission free. They have mailing list tools so that you can manage your mailing lists and newsletters and grow your fan base. Of course, all the social media integrations that you'd want. And because they're built by musicians for musicians, live support from their musician-friendly team is available seven days a week. Because you are a GigGab listener, you can go to Banzoogle.com to try it free for 30 days and use our promo code GigGab, all one word. There's three G's, two of them are together, G-I-G-G-A-B. Promo code GigGab gets you 15% off your first year of any subscription. That's Banzoogle.com, promo code GigGab, and our thanks to Banzoogle for sponsoring this episode. All right. So we did. We talked. We, we started the conversation about uh, stages without speakers on the stage, right? The only speakers being the ones in our ears and the ones aimed towards front of house. And... Uh, it was a great discussion in our Facebook group about this. And then, like I said, Dan East uh, sort of took it into a gear gab direction. <laughs> <laughs> as so he is wont to do. <laughs> as he is wont to do. But I, I want him to do that. So I am happy for it. Uh, I, I will try to kind of go through this and and the uh, the the share some of the some of the 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 lessons that he's got for us. He says, uh and I'm going to pop in, pop in and out of his email, so I will try to make it sound cohesive. But if it doesn't, that's my fault, not Dan's. Uh, if you want a setup-and-go standalone system that would use your mics and cables, the easiest compact solution, no matter what size the venue, would be something like a Yamaha TF rack or similar product that has 16 aux sends so that you can have up to six stereo in-ears uh, in case you want to, and in case you want to mix the room, boxes for left right and sub remain. Plus he says it's a really it's really nice because if your Wi-Fi goes down you can keep mixing on the screen on the rack as needed. That of course is something that comes up when we talk about you asked last week, do we have the capability or does the do does an item exist that looks like a stage box and you just mix with your iPad and, and we talked about the DL thirty two S and other items in the Mackie line and, and other lines that are exactly that. But if your Wi-Fi goes down, you literally have no interface for these things. So, um, so Dan likes the Yamaha TFs, and I can understand why. Uh, and he says, uh, let's see, in terms of guitars being ampless, he says, I run this all day, every day, at every size venue you can imagine, and there are really too many solutions to be useful. Oddly enough, he says, the one that I think sounds the best is the Pod Go. Do you know about this Pod Go, Paul? Does that sound? I do. Okay. He says, uh, Dan says, I prefer it to the big Helix uh, because the sounds that you can uh, load and download have as natural and broad amp sound as you wish. The uh, Do you have anything to say about the uh, the Pod Go before we before I keep going here on this? Because we can we can dissect dissect each of these. The Pod Go is from. Is that line six, Paul? Is that right? Yeah, it's line six. And, okay. you know, line six has several lines of modelers now. They have, you know, several price points starting from, you know, I think about $400 up to about $1,700. I don't think that the Pod Go is the same audio engine as in the Helix stuff. They're higher end things. I'm not positive about that. Sure. But I know that they have the Helix, you know, which is really high end. And they have some Helix floor models, LT. Um, that all purportedly have the same audio engine, but I think the pod might be a different engine. I'm not sure why they would do that instead of just reusing the uh, technology. But um, in general, I have found Line 6's digital technology uh, across many things, their wireless technology and their modeling technology, to be really, really good. Huh. And so the Pod Go is pretty inexpensive. I actually will have more to say on this in a little while because I just got one of those Acoustasonic guitars, Really? I don't know if you know what that is, but Fender, you know, came out with these guitars that are these hybrid acoustic electrics. They have acoustic modeling pickups in one 
switch position and then a telecaster or or jazz master or stratocaster pickup in another position but you know you'd need to put it through something so yeah. um, i may be able to just bring this one guitar to my acoustic gigs now and add some electric feel to it but also be able to or the other way around like if i want to if i have one song that i need to play acoustic with a house rockers gig rather than bring another guitar and having to you know have to set up you know and all the unique things that would go on with having an acoustic playing at those loud volumes. Yeah. This may be a great solution for that. But anyway, yes, I think Line 6 stuff is pretty freaking awesome. They do a great job. The You know, sonically, they're, they're really beautiful. Yeah. Interesting. I'm, I'm curious about this acoustasonic. I, I remember, you know, for the live concert sound thing, uh, you know, I'm a huge Rush fan, but they exposed me to a lot of technology that for the first time, uh, you know, for any given piece of tech, because those guys were always kind of on the edge for that anyway. Plus they were always mm -hmm. looking for ways to best replicate the sounds they made on an album live. And Alex Lifeson uh, was a, a bit of an inventor, but he also loved working with other inventors. And he uh, for years would use an acoustic guitar on stage when he needed an acoustic guitar. And then I remember one tour where he, was testing out some, you know, one of a kind pickups that would turn, make his electric sound like an acoustic. And it really did. Like it was amazing. So I'm, I, I'm curious how well Fender has done. And it could be the same tech, right? Like, you know, that's how these things start. They start. In well, there's a few place. different ones. And especially I would imagine Lifeson being Canadian might've worked with Godan because Godan has had guitars that do that pretty effectively for a while. Okay. All right. All right. Canadian manufacturers. Yeah, I don't know. It was some pickups that he just put on his, you know, whatever he had. I don't know. You know, he, he was Alex Lifeson. Still is, turns out. Yeah. <laughs> Still is. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, Dan goes on. He says, so that's for guitars. He says, for a bass, a passive bass with a tube DI, like a radial flyer fly, firefly, easy for me to say, or a ready, R-E-D-D-I. I've, I, I got to ask him what uh, what he meant by that, because I've searched around. Do you know anything about a ready, R-E-D-D-I? I -D -D -I? don't. Okay, I, I don't know if that was a typo or just some thing that Google doesn't know how to help me find. Uh, and he says for an active, active base is the R-N-D-I. And he says the R-N-D-I is just incredible for 300 bucks. So we will put links to as many of these things as we can find links for in the show notes. And I'm sure Dan will follow up uh, with us on this ready. I wish I'd realized to reach out to him ahead of time for that. Uh, on the, we talked last week about XLR splitters, uh, the idea of you, you have your own, you know, you have your mixer. It is set up for you. It's set up for your in-ears dialed in for all of your stuff and you want to give the front of house all of the inputs so that they can mix effectively out front. And, uh, and I, I mentioned split tails that, which is the idea of having a splitter that takes the signal that you have from one microphone and sends it to two different mixers, one for you, for your in-ears and perhaps something on stage and then one out to the front of house so that they can mix it and and you're all good. And Dan says the uh, the parallel passive ones are fine for a short split. The key is to remember that for phantom powered mics, it can only be powered from one console or source. Just something to be aware of if you try this. So I guess the idea would be maybe you power your own mics and you tell front of house to, that nothing needs phantom power. I guess that would be one way of, of dealing with it. And he likes, uh, which is, he says, surprising. He says a solid basic passive splitter, and he's not usually a fan of ART, is the ART, eight input splitter. And uh, and he says that one sounds good and works good for relatively short runs. It's the S8 three-way. So I will put a link to that in the show notes. Um, I've never used one of these, but I, I have a feeling... I'm going to get to the point where it's, it's, this is something that I want because, uh, <laughs> well, I, I mean, it, you know, it, it, there is a benefit, especially for a band like Fling, where everybody is moving to in-ears. It's a massive headache to show up. Like for me showing up at a club, like with like when Bitter Pill plays or when Fling has played in the past, and I'm the only one on in-ears, right? So we ask for one feed, 
I I am a nerd with this stuff. I'm fully comfortable with most of the apps that are out there to mix your ears. And if I'm not comfortable, if, if one is new to me, I, I'm pretty good at sussing it out. And, you know, uh, to my point before, not being a source of friction for the engineer, right? And it works out great. But I know that not everybody is a nerd like me, and that's okay. So how do we solve for that? How do we make it so that for the front of house engineer, we as a band don't become known as being a pain in the ass, right? You know, I, I want to be able to show up and be easy for them because I I don't want them to tell whoever booked us, don't book that band again, please. They were a pain in the ass, you, you know? So the, the trick is going to be, you know, if I'm in a band where everybody is, you know, or many people are on ears, mm -hmm. it's probably helpful to show up with a rig like this where it's just like, yeah, we'll take care sure. of our ears. You, you do your thing, we'll do ours. And, and so, I, like I said, I have a feeling that, that something like this and, and probably two of them or, or maybe more is in my future and that's okay. It's fine. Well, I'll figure it out. Something. Mm. So thank you, Dan, for that recommendation. One last one, if I can, if that's okay. Uh, he says, another subject of conversation worth having is understanding the differences in the headphone amp sections of the personal satellite mixers when hardwired. So many on board to the mixer are awful and cheap, especially for higher ohm headphones or in-ears. And so much so that a solid in-ear monitor amp can make all the difference in the world. So this is for those of us like drummers or keyboard players who are in a fixed position throughout the night such that we don't need wireless in-ears, right? Mm. Um, and because it's super tempting to just plug into the headphone amp on the, on the mixer, so much so that it's what I do 95% of the time. Uh, he says, uh, my favorite of these, uh, you know, Secondary preamp wireless uh, or wired systems are the Albatross Audio PH9. He says uh, it's an immediate, incredibly di apparent dramatic improvement to any IEM that's wired. All right. So this is the part where this episode starts costing Dave money right away. <laughs> uh, but that's okay. It's fine. He says uh, their products are just stunningly great quality. On the more basic side, okay, so I'm going to have to buy two of these, you're telling me, Dan. The Elite Core PMA, which also has an optional wired belt pack volume attenuator. Oh, that could be nice. Okay. See? Friggin' Dan, man. It's, Dan. Yep. It's how it That's is. A friendship. Uh, he says, it's better than the Behringer, Personas, Fisher, and Sure models. Rolls used to be where the standard at this price point was. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I use, when I'm getting a feed from the board, I use a Rolls PM50 which I'll also put in the show notes because it like it works and it sounds good. He says, but they are no longer as low frequency capable as they once were. So I'm wondering if perhaps some things have changed with the Rolls units. Cause yeah, I get plenty of low end through my, my Rolls headphone amp and it's, you know, it's rock solid. I, I was recently thinking, I know for a while Rolls was making a version of the PM 50 that was battery powered, and there's been a there have been a couple of gigs lately where getting a it's weird. Everybody else on stage, like it's assumed that you need power, right? But for us drummers, they think we don't need power. Even though we say we need a feed for our in-ears, it's never thought to bring power. Now, as I'm saying this out loud, I realize, hey, the only thing you need to do, Dave, is put it on the the stage plot that you need an outlet near the drums. <laughs> However, I didn't think of that. The first thing I thought of was, well, maybe I need more gear. And I know why I thought that. <laughs> we all know why I thought that. Uh, and I thought, well, I should just get the battery powered version of the rolls and then I'm good to go. But, uh, but maybe I just need to get one of these other things and put on the, the stage plot power near the uh, thing. So I know Russ and Billy listen to this, so maybe they will take care of me and put a uh, AC power by the drummer, uh, on the uh, on the stage plots that they share out for us. So, yeah. All right. Thanks, Dan. This was yeah. uh, 13 minutes of gear gab bliss, and I didn't even have to do any research for it, which I love. But I do have to go find links. So, Dan's a freaking treasure. Dan is a treasure. I agree with that. Yeah, he's a and he's a good human too. Like in addition to being knowledgeable and 
and happy to share and an active member of our gig gab community in a variety of ways, including having guests on the show several times. He's just, uh, yeah, he's a good human. I a like delightful it. person. He's yeah. a giver. He's a, he is a giver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, I feel like this is costing me, so I'm not sure how that works. <laughs> but he's not the one taking, so. <laughs> no, it's true. That's right. Yes, that's fair. That's fair. I lead a charmed life. I'm not actually complaining about this, but I, 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 I mean, I am a little bit, but uh, it's fine. It's fine. I, we do these um, with Mac Geek, uh, one of the other podcasts I do. And if you're an Apple user, you might like it. MacGeekGab.com. Uh, we do the, this segment on it called Cool Stuff Found, where we talk about all the cool gear we found. And we used to, and again, just recently did, a, we used to do entire episodes of Cool Stuff Found. And our listeners asked us, not to do that as frequently anymore. They're like, could you just do segments of it? Because <laughs> it's costed us too much money. Those episodes cost us a fortune. So funny. Yeah. It wasn't a, an uncommon refrain. And I got it recently. We 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 did an episode with our friend Jeff Gamet, uh, who I know you know, and it it was not intentional for any of you who are crossover listeners. We did not intend for it to just become a cool stuff found episode, but it did. And so I'm sorry, not sorry. Anyway, it's fun. I love gear. What can I say? I know we fun. all do as musicians. Yeah. yeah you know, I have a theory that one of the things about gear, gear for gear's sake is fun, but shopping for gear and thinking about gear and thinking about how gear will make your, it, it's, it fills the time between <laughs> gigs. I mean, if you can't be gigging 24 hours a day and, and you, most of us would, if we could, you know, gear is just something that keeps the juices flowing in between times we get to do. And then, you know, the thought that something might make our, make our performances better or make our lives easier in, in performing. It's, it's, um, that's what gear is. It fills the space between when you get to actually do the stuff you love to do. Yeah. I, yes, I agree. I, I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm looking at this, uh, elite core ECPMA personal monitor amplifier. You were talking about gear and it looks like, does it actually have a battery? Oh, it does have a battery pocket. Batteries are not your friend though, Dave. I mean, you got to got to remember to charge batteries or bring batteries. Or I know, but but that's the thing is like it can do both, right? You can either power it with the AC adapter or with a battery. So, right. if I keep a I, if I keep a 9 volt battery in my bag, and while I would never admit this to any guitar player or bass player that I with whom I share the stage, but with just between us girls here, I will admit that I do keep spare nine volt batteries because sometimes those people need them. So I always have a nine volt battery with me because, you know, it's how it works. Uh, well, I'll share our secret here. You know, I, I always say everybody needs a bill because we have our sound guy who yeah. is just the greatest guy in the world. He has one drawer in our utility rack, you know, so there's all the wireless units and you, you guess you can get these utility drawers that pull out and he keeps them stocked with, you know, batteries. Everybody pitches in, sure, you know, to buy, you know, one case of batteries, uh, and they're they're there. So we get to the gig. We always know where they are. We go up to the drawer. We take our double A's out, and away we go. I love or, it. Or nine volts. I uh, I think I posted this in our gig gab group, but I was I was chatting with my friend uh, and a listener to the show, Chip B, and uh, and I I I typed a term, and I realized. You know, like I heard the heavens go, oh, I've referred for years to my security blanket box, the thing that has all of those things in it. Like that when I was gigging in high school, there was no security blanket box. Right. And then over time, I encountered scenarios at gigs that were like, wow, this would be so much better. Or we could play the gig if only we had this tiny little thing that would solve all of our problems. And. All of those things that I've encountered and needing at times over the years have now made their way into my security blanket box. And so that box will always be my security blanket because it makes me feel better when I put it in the car to head to a gig. But it does have a new name, Paul. That name is the Justin case. Just in case. Right? It's the Justin case. It holds all the things that I might need just in yeah. case. Yeah. And without it, you're really, you know, on the high wire without a net, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Oh, I, I, there was one gig recently where because of space in the car, I was like, all right, I know this venue. I know that we're going to be there with a front of house team. They're going to have everything they need. I'm going to leave the, the just in case at home. But man, it, I was not 
I was freaked out until everything was set up on stage and everybody was good to go. And then I was like, okay, right, we're good. It's rare that I need to dig into it, but three or four times a year, there's something in there where it's like, oh, yep, I got you covered. It's good to go. I keep one of those Joyo uh, amp simulators in there. Yeah, I, prob yeah. I probably shouldn't share this, uh, but I do keep one in there for all the guitar players I play with in case their amp dies or, you know, something's wrong. It's like, yep, plug into this, plug into the PA. You can now play the gig. So, yeah, it's good. good. Yes, the just in case. So I was, I was really proud when I, when I, uh, very clever when trademark. I, when I came up with that. Oh yeah. I'll, I'll put a, I'll, I'll put a little trademark term on the, uh, in the show notes. I know how to do this. There it is. Yep. Good. It's there. <laughs> All right, man. It's been a long day. Normally we record this earlier in the day. I had a bunch of meetings and so now I'm exhausted, but you know, it's but been we, a fun. Episode. The show must go on. The show did go on. I think we even recorded it. If you're hearing this good news, yeah. <laughs> we recorded it. Win. Yeah, it's a win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you got anything else, man? Or are we, uh, are we in the outro and I just don't know it yet? No, we're going to have a lot of good stuff to talk about going forward. Like I said, I, th I think I have 19 gigs in, in May and, mm. you know, all told. And it's a blessing to have all this work and, you know, it's good work too. I mean, it's, you know, people are excited to get music out. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot of good things coming up. So I look forward to talking about it. I can't wait to talk about it. Yeah. I got a bunch of stuff coming up too. Although May is full of travel for me. I have some... I got to pick up my son from school and then a little bit of a uh, much delayed trip, but uh, that I'm sure we'll talk about as things come up too. But, uh, but yeah, the summer's full of gigs. I'm stoked about it. Cool. Yeah. Good. Yeah. 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 All right, folks. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks for listening to the show. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. It doesn't just have to be Danny's. If you have any suggestions for gear, anything, even if it's something that replaces something we've already mentioned, obviously, let us know. It's the only way we're going to know. What's that thing we say? Always be performing. <laughs>